All right, y'all. So we're going to be recording this webinar. And um, before we get started, just wanted to um, let folks know that your video is not required at all. Um, it's totally fine, I suppose, if that's the best way for you to engage. It's helpful. But for those who are calling, know that we are um, we are recording it. Um, and there is a webinar, you know, there are slides involved so that we encourage you to find a way to, to call in with the video component so that you can fully um, appreciate and take in the info that we've prepared for you today. Um, so we'll just really pretty much get started. One thing I will say before we start the content is that you all should feel free to, um, as we go along, put your questions in the chat box, which again, if you're calling, that's not possible. So again, another reason we encourage you to, to call in um, with the video component. Um, and so we'll, we'll do our best to check and, and be responsive to those as the day goes on, as the call goes on. Um, and just again, to note, uh, not again, but for the first time, the webinar, we're not giving out legal or partisan advice. Um, and this content is not a substitute for obtaining personal representation, personal legal representation. Just saying that out loud. Um, yeah, so great. So we're just gonna let you all know a little about our presenters. Um, there is myself. <laughs> Currently speaking, my name is Jay Marie. Um, I'm the trans justice organizer at the ACLU of Missouri. Um, I work to educate people and empower folks through the state of Missouri and nationally through um, art, cycling, music, organizing, all sorts of things. Um, and I uh, really wanted to make sure that you all got this information today. So that's part of how we're making our way here. And, um, and then to introduce my co-presenters, we have Charles, who is here from the Civil Rights Enforcement Agency, yes. when you get it correct. Um, and he's held various positions in state and city government, including area rep for the Missouri Housing Development Commission, Neighborhood Development Executive, Senior Policy Advisor, Director of the Department of Public Safety, and Director of the Civil Rights Enforcement Agency under both Mayor Slay and Mayor Leiter Houston. So Charles is very, very experienced, very deeply, you know, rooted in making sure that folks are represented and, and taken care of on a city and, and state level in, in ways that we can make it happen. Anything else you want to add, Charles? That'd be it. Thank All you. Right. No Good problem. To be here. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Great to have you. Um, and then next, next we have Samadhi, who is. Um, the manager of public policy at Promo. Samadhi came to St. Louis almost 10 years ago and has completed his master's degree in social work, obtained his clinical license um, in social work and is proud to make St. Louis his home. He's proudly served as a Brian White case manager for people living with HIV for the past five years and he's excited to work at Promo. Welcome Samadhi. Thanks. Thank yeah. you you're like coming this way a little bit. Yeah, too far, sorry. No, you're good. Hello. Um, so great y'all. Small, small. <laughs> Indeed. So, um, before we, we dig deep into specifics about how to be in your, kind of in your bag with it, when it comes to your rights, when it comes to making sure that you are um, fully aware of what you, what you can be doing what, if something happens, um, we wanted to just situate uh, kind of why this webinar now, right? So some of you may have heard, some of you may have not heard actually, right? So um, upcoming, this upcoming week, Tuesday, October 8th, the Supreme Court, the United States, SCOTUS, is hearing two types of cases spread between three different cases. So the first case is the consolidated case um, of a case called Zarda versus Altitude Express. And another case is Bostick versus Clayton County. And both of those have been consolidated because they determine whether or not sexual orientation discrimination is a form of sex discrimination. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that. But essentially what we want you to know about it is that this is kind of the LGBTQ portion of like the community being Kind of represented in this case. Um, this this time that we're that we're in right now is really unique because these cases really do represent the span of the community. It's not just queerness or just lesbian or gay folks. It's like and it's not just trans folks. It's really all of the community at one time, kind of being litigated or discussed. Um, and and as as frustrating as that can be for those of us who are in community, um, definitely just want to name that we're all kind of on the chopping block a little bit here. And um, it's a really important time for us to acknowledge that both cases are happening. So there's this first case that I mentioned that is specifically talking about sexual orientation. Um, and we'll talk about the sex discrimination piece. But the second um, case is, or the second type of case is one that is, is referred to as Harris Funeral Homes versus the EEOC, which um, for those who might have heard of this or 
might, you might know this as like the Stevens case um, because Stevens is the person who is being represented by the EEOC. And this case is working to determine whether or not anti-trans discrimination is a form of sex, sex discrimination. Um, both of these are essentially um, the way that we believe they sell you and the way that other, um, well, I'll, I'll stay on this for a second, but the way that the reason we believe uh, these are included in the sex discrimination is not only because we've argued many cases um, that has have been ruled in indeed that this does fall under sex discrimination, but really there is no way to talk about both sexual orientation discrimination or anti-trans or trans discrimination without talking about sex. Um, and you know, as we know, like sex and gender and all the conversations that we have internal to community are one type of conversation, but when it comes to the law, it's a whole nother thing. So we definitely want you to at least know that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, we believe does, we believe and legal precedent has shown that it does um, protect people on the basis of sex. And so that's just something to keep in mind as we go through today. Um, a couple more pieces about why this webinar now. One thing that's crucial to know, because um, I, I just didn't want community to get confused or frustrated with how some of these headlines might make, you know, throw you into a frenzy which is that we won't, that we won't know the outcome of the decision that the Supreme Court is deciding until next year, until June, probably maybe a little earlier, because this is really early. They literally start their session on Monday, and Tuesday is the day they're hearing these cases. But most likely, we won't know until the spring, maybe, you know, early summer. So we just want you to know that this next week is not the time to feel like last year when they did that, like, you know, the Trump memo that came out and we're being erased. Like, this is not that same thing. This is something different, but we really wanted to take this as a chance to kind of um, clarify what you can do now. So it's both, we want you to know about this, this case happening next week, as well as this was an opportunity for us to let you know what, what rights you have. Um, and, and really we wanted you to know that even if you are currently having trouble or having issues at, at a workplace, we want you to be fully empowered and recognize that we are currently being discussed, litigated, and like, you know, our rights are, and our identities are being discussed. Um, and we wanted to be clear that, you know, this is a chance to re-up on what our rights are, right? Re-up on what our laws are currently, um, as well as if you don't know what those are or haven't been aware of what they are, recognize essentially how limited they are and help you mobilize to expand them. Um, one thing I'll say, one more thing about sex and gender, which let me pause just to double check these questions. Um, yeah, okay, great. No worries, no questions. <laughs> Shout out to Niles for taking a couple of those photos. Um, so sex versus gender. Um, like I said, in community, those of us who are queer, trans, all of that, this, is, this conversation is one very frustrating thing. Um, but in the law, it's a completely different conversation. Um, but really, what, ha what is incredible is the work that folks who do practice law have done to make sure that we are protected as many different ways as possible, but by just kind of one simple argument. And it's essentially saying that, well, what, what, the, what, what you should know about these cases is that a funeral home and really the kind of the container is that people who are opposed to sex covering all these different kinds of discriminations, um, they're arguing that essentially Congress back in the day in 1964 wasn't thinking about trans people when it, when it included sex discrimination in Title VII, which does not matter at all, right? It, like something, that's, that'd be like saying, you know, the, the Bill of Rights and, and the Fourth Amendment that's like saying you can't have, you, get, you have a right to privacy doesn't count for computers or doesn't count for like, you know, for, uh, for planes or anything that happened after something was written. That doesn't make any sense. So as we know, people are, the people who are arguing against our rights are deeply behind the times, will be seen as silly very short, very shortly. Um, and essentially what we respond, the plaintiffs respond that Title VII um, does not specifically mention sexual orientation or trans transgender status, but these identities are covered under sex or sex stereotyping because this is established by legal precedent. Many, many, many cases, many states have actually argued this and, and won. So the issue um, is whether Title VII of the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits sex discrimination, protects LGBT people from, LGBTQ people, of course, from job discrimination. So that's just the container of preparation we wanted you to have. Um, and, and I hope that that's helpful. I hope that you all read up a lot more because there's really, you know, obviously people do this for a living, but wanted to make sure that as we jump into the current kind of what you can do for your rights, you are aware of the context because this is bigger than just, you know, your rights or someone else's rights. It's like a whole container of things that we should all know about. Um, so we're going to start talking about the process. 
for those who are calling because you are, are dealing with something um, employment related or you just wanna kinda get caught up on what your options are, we are gonna start into that. So we're gonna start um, at the city level first, or actually at, at your job level, right? So something's happening, um, and here we're gonna transition into what you should be doing if you're being discriminated against or disrespected at work. Mine, yeah. you got for it. So, um, probably, a lot of you probably know this already, but if you don't, a lot of larger employers, like, for better for worse, like Target, Walmart, places like that have some kind of non-discrimination or anti-harassment policy in place already. So if you feel, if you feel or are experiencing discrimination or harassment at the workplace, um, look through your employee handbook or like contact your human resources person and figure out what's going on and learn how to file a complaint. Your human resources person should be able to help you do that. That's like half of what their job is for. Um, each workplace will have a different process. But there should be something in place for you to document that. And if you are, if you're afraid to document that, there should be something else in there that will say, like, if you are retaliated against or someone comes back at you for accusing them of discrimination, you have some additional protections against that as well. Um, if you work at a place that is fortunate enough, well, a little biased, but fortunate enough to have a union, um, you have extra protections as well. You should contact your union rep as soon as possible to lodge a complaint and help address that. Um, but the most important thing we, you can do when you're, if you're experiencing discrimination is, because we're gonna ask you what, who, when, so like just document all that as it happens. Who was in that meeting? Who, who, who heard what happened? Who was in that interview with you? Um, and a good an example of that, so a form of discrimination that cases have, courts have used several times is, if you're a trans person and someone repeatedly misgenders you and repeatedly uses the wrong name, that is a form of workplace discrimination. And since you have email now, um, if you've emailed a, a, someone, a coworker or a boss, like, hey, this is my name now, please call me this instead, and they repeatedly don't do that, you have evidence that you've asked them to do that and they're not doing it. Um, a couple of things that also count as discrimination. So it's not just like not getting the job or getting fired, it's also not getting the promotion, or not getting the raise. So if you look around, like you see some things happening about that, that's something important to look at as well. Um, and we're asking folks to do this at folks who from at promo to do this. If you are experiencing workplace discrimination, even though there are no no federal or state protections, that you still file a complaint with the Equal Opportunity Commission, they will investigate. They will, to the best of their ability, they will investigate that claim, and they will ask for the same information: who, what, who said what, who did what, when, what are the receipts, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Some pieces that you mentioned here just add, that I want to echo, mm -hmm. um, and that will come up more as we go, but just the distinction between like a, a coworker being like rude or, or dismissive and somebody being outright discriminatory in a way that actually impacts your ability to show up fully yes. and healthily at work, right? So we know internally to community that we have ideally really high standards for how we want people to treat us, and we know that not everybody is um, either gonna abide by those or even knows the rules that we have internally come up with. We would love to make sure that people know those things, but. Do you have any advice for clarifying whether or not something is kind of discriminatory versus just abrasive or ignorant? Sure. Um, so, uh, someone making a comment about like, gen like, screwing up your pronouns or screwing up like your sexual orientation like once or twice and like, isn't like here and there isn't harassment. It sucks and it's annoying and it's super microaggressiony. Absolutely. But if someone is repeatedly intentionally I guess what's the word with malintent, but also like if it's affecting your ability to do your job, like you don't want to come into work, um, not just because it's work, but because like <laughs> this person's creating a hostile environment that you have to be in yeah. eight plus hours a day, or if you're being denied leadership positions like on committees or teams, um, those are the kind of things we're looking at. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to check this question real quick. And um, also wanted to highlight, wow, my mouse is on the working way. I wanted to highlight um, what you mentioned here about um, being prepared with, with documentation, which I believe Charles will talk a little bit more about. But really, um, you know, we didn't want it to be under stressed, really, that like documentation is crucial, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, again, like who, where, when, what was said, like all of that. Um, like you mentioned here, the process can seem long and tedious and varies, but 
really, um, and take away that question, I'll say yes, but um, we want you to, essentially you have to be the person that takes your work seriously and your experience seriously, because there is a very good chance that every, many, many, any step along the way will seek to undermine you, right? Or will seek to tell you that what you experienced wasn't real. And so you are the, you are the person who knows what your experience was and as much as it's frustrating and as much as it's indicative of, you know, force, forces at work that we wish weren't the case, um, your documentation is gonna be crucial and your ability to have other people to back you up is also crucial, mm -hmm. right? It's like organizing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any thoughts about some of the comments that are in the um, chat? That's a good question. Um, I know this has come up a lot when I, whenever I talk about the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act, spoilers for later in the presentation. <laughs> um, like we are, in, Missouri is an at-will state, so it means that technically you can, one can be fired from their job for any reason. And maybe Carl's gonna with this as we get go forward, but there, I think there are limitations to that. Kind of like how like a restaurant has the right to refuse service. Sure, yes. And if it's based on a protected category or person, that's, that's that's not gonna that's that doesn't fly. So I think there are limitations to that. Um, hence why the documentation piece is important, right? So like, ultimate universe. I'm not working at Promo. If I get fired from my job and they just say like, well, we just didn't like you, but I have documentation repeatedly that like I've been disparaged and there are negative comments made about my ethnicity or race. That's that kind of changes the at will portion of that because then there's. A doc, is that correct? Is it? Right. Yeah, because then there's more of a documented reason for that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this was discrimination versus like, meh, mm -hmm. leave. <laughs> and if, you're, if you're not doing your job, then yes, they can, right. <laughs> they can get rid of you. But if you're doing your job and if you've been given um, good or great uh, 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 reviews over the mm -hmm. number of years and you, and you can document that, oh, by the way, uh, my supervisor called me this, uh, mm -hmm they've done other things to me, then yeah, it makes a difference. Because then you can say, it wasn't just that it's an at-will state, there are specific reasons why they decided to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. And of course, Missouri has made that as difficult as possible, but um, great question. So for those who didn't catch it, the question was, how do these employer-based protections square with at-will contracts, which is um, I, almost every non-union contract in Missouri. And so the answer is essentially keep really incredible documentation of even the little things that might be hard to describe or might be hard to like prove in a way, like if you experience it, the goal is for you and your experience to be heard and seen and valued in the process to figure out what to do about it, right? So if, if your experience wasn't documented well enough or the people don't know, um, you know, might, who are reading it don't know the intricacies or the details, like you have to be able to explain that in a way that will be frustrating, right? In a way that will feel infuriating probably at times, but we're hoping that by telling you this now, you can go into your workplace recognizing like what your rights are and recognizing how you can be diligent from the beginning or from wherever you're starting from. Hopefully none of you are doing like really intense things right now, but that might be the case. Um, cool. So that is pretty much how a, how a, how a, an employment-based process would, be, would work. Um, what we're gonna go to now is essentially say, you know, you go through that process and you're still, you know, not quite, I mean, you can talk about this, how to transition from that, but essentially there's beyond your city, beyond your, your employer, what do you do? What can you do, Charles? You got us, you got us covered here? Yeah, I think the, uh, so if you, one of the things we really want to do is work with your employer. That may not be possible for a wide variety of reasons. If that is the case, then what you would do is you would call or email us, send us, us, us would be the Civil Rights Enforcement Agency <laughs> of the City of St. Louis, and I should say that we cover the river to Skinker. So if the business is in the city of St. Louis, or if you are applying, we also say if you're applying in the city for somewhere and uh, you believe, not you think, but you believe that this didn't go right for some reason and you believe that there's discrimination, to, to go ahead and, and file a claim of discrimination uh, with our office and uh, we will do that. We're an impartial fact-finding institution uh, we have a contract with EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, to conduct investigations in the city. Um, and then we will, uh, uh, we will do that investigation as fast as we can, because we know time is, time is money. Um, and so you'll give us that information and, and what everyone has said, which is really crucial. Tell your family, tell your friends, write a diary or a journal of some sort. Keep notes of, of two things. One is, the initial discrimination that took place and and what that looks and it feels like 
but the other is possible retaliation. And so if I tell somebody I'm thinking about turning in a form or a claim of discrimination, and then all of a sudden I get moved from my lofty office in the corner to the middle of the floor, or if I move from the first shift where I've been for 20 years to the third shift where I have to struggle to get my kids to school or whatever, that's a form of retaliation. And I know the EEOC really does not like retaliation. And so, so those are, and those are two separate charges, by the way. So even if we actually find that well, you not you were not discriminated against, we may find that you were retaliated against for calling us and, and asking for a claim of discrimination. Um, I think the, the, the other important part is um, don't what I call sour grape it. Well, I didn't want that job anyway. Mm -hmm. I didn't want that promotion anyway. Or be fearful um, because again, in baked in federal law and baked in law in the city of St. Louis, therefore, is the issue of retaliation. And we will take that very seriously because we believe, in fact, 51% of all the claims in the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission are based on retaliation. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't find discrimination, they might find that, well, that you retaliated against me simply because I turned in a form and said, I think that, that things are not going right for me. Um, the other key point was about discrimination and what you would call the one-off. Somebody might say something wrong, somebody might actually do something wrong, but it, if it's repeated time after time after time, that is a form of discrimination or a hostile work environment, which is a form of discrimination. So I'm, I, and those are, and I just read up on this today, glances and looks, mm. somebody staring at you, somebody rubbing up against you inappropriately. Um, there's a lot of little subtle things that go on uh, that you may try to pass off and say, well, they didn't really mean that or they didn't really do that. Those are form of a hostile work environment, which is also um, against the law and against uh, EEOC policy and therefore it's against the city of St. Louis. So we will take your claim of discrimination seriously. Um, what we're also kind of looking to see is, as we get toward the Supreme Court ruling, how narrow or how long, large the Supreme Court ruling is. A narrow ruling may just be on the merits of those particular cases and therefore wouldn't affect the local law, which basically says, and this is um, 68715, is the city ordinance that talks about uh, discrimination on the, on, on the basis of sex and gender. And so if it's a narrow ruling, it may keep our uh, ordinances in place, and that's what we're hoping for at the very least. If not, sex is gender, and let's be done away with this madness and, <laughs> and uh, make sure that everybody's protected. Thank you. That's okay. great. Um, so we'll have it just feel free to mention something if you, if you, in the, in the chat, if you have want to clarify, I think we have some, um, questions here. What rep should you contact again? So I think the question here was, it might've been maybe before oh, your you. section. Yeah, I think it was, um, I think you're talking Alex about the union or maybe what rep just in general. Mm -hmm. And we'll go back to that slide just to, um, mention it. Whoops. So what we had said here was, um, and somebody, if you won't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to say it. Yeah, so, if, so when I say rep, so sorry for using lingo. So it's like you're, if you're in a union, you should have a designated union representative that you talk to about any issues at your workplace, including issues of discrimination. And if you have, if you work in human resources, there should be a contact person that you can talk to as well. So like um, the infectious disease clinic that I worked at at WashU that, we had like a specific person to contact at human resources if we had an issue, whether that was like an insurance thing or like fill out this form that says we work here or whether it was like I've been discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And unions, uh, a lot of times will have a shop steward mm -hmm. as kind of the starting point, someone who works actually in uh, that environment and that might be the first point of contact, but, but you're right, they should, that should be spelled out somewhere in their union information. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple other comments, um, which we're get, it's about the county as one. So we'll see if we can start the county process okay. before we answer that question. Um, but great questions y'all so far. Thank you for, for sticking with us. Um, so county process, tell us. Yeah, tell us so, what we can 
But we should know about the county. In case you're new to St. Louis or don't know this, we have like 90 municipalities in the, in, in the St. Louis County area. Um, I could not get a list of this and I will get this to you, I'll get this to you, Jay Marie. Um, so each one of these parts, each one of these municipalities in the county has a different human rights statute. They have to have their own to get protection, um, to have protections for LGBTQ folks or any other uh, category of person. Um, not all of them have sexual orientation and gender identity. Some have, some have sexual orientation and don't have gender identity. So it really depends on which municipality you live in or which municipality you're applying to work in or currently work in, and you can handle that. So you have to go to that municipality's website, whether that's Ferguson or whether that's Florissant or one of the other bajillions of them that there are, uh, Creve Corps, Al the Alabet, Frontenac, whatever, any, uh, Frontenac or Town and Country, whichever one that is. Um, so you would go to that, what their, that, you know, like, town, like government, local government website and see like, I've been the like, harassment discrimination policy and there'll be like a form or documentation for you to fill out or a person to contact. If you don't live, if you live in, a, in St. Louis County and you're, and where you live is not an incorporated part of the county. A municipality. A municipality. So it's not a municipality, it's just part of St. Louis County. You can contact the St. Louis County Executive Office directly to file a complaint specifically. Um, because if you live in an unincorporated part of the county, you have you have those protections. That's given, but that covers like weird spots of people, weird spots in zip codes, not not all of the county. Um, AJ may put the state process up here, but there is no state level protection for discrimination for LGBTQ folks, and there really isn't a person or office to contact that will address those complaints. Um, Can you tell us before we jump yeah. deeply to state why? So. We talked about employer level. Mm -hmm. We talked about city level, mm -hmm. with and or municipality mm -hmm. slash county level. Tell us like why you might need state level state protections and why people should care. That yeah, not a state. So I like to say that it shouldn't really matter where we live in the state of Missouri. We should have protections from discrimination. So when 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 legislative so just like which you shouldn't have to like if you're in the county you shouldn't have to live in like municipality A to get protections, but then if you get a, if there's like a better job in municipality B, you should not have those protections from discrimination. That's not, that's not, that's just not right. Shouldn't be that, <laughs> that shouldn't be that shouldn't way. Shouldn't be that way. Shouldn't yeah. be rele relegated to where you live to right. have mm -hmm. protections. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so because we don't have state level protections, what that means is you either have to live in one of those cities or mm -hmm. municipalities that have protections, or you then don't. Well, yeah, and you run the risk of facing discrimination that you cannot get justice for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or accountability or mm -hmm. any of that. So, so one thing that we wanted to um, respond to is that, let's see, I think the question is basically, is there a CREA for the county? No, there's <laughs> not a CREA for the county, unfortunately. And I think the other question that we could tag onto that is, how would people who don't live in the St. Louis area, but are still in Missouri, like, are there any other organizations, um, you know, commissions, different types of bodies that hold folks accountable, employers and different um, organizations. Like, is there any other things that we could look up or, or send people to that would help them think of or, or be able to look up what they might need? Like, sure, well, there, there is the, the EEOC will actually take your uh, case or your claim on discrimination. And they have an office in St. Louis. So even though we have a contract with them to cover the city, um, if you live in the county or any other place in Missouri, the uh, local EEOC office, Equal Employment Opportunity Office, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission Office, would uh, would take your claim of discrimination. And they would do the investigation. Um, other than that, there are not really any um, groups or institutions on the employment side, on the housing side, because we also cover fair housing issues. Uh, you would have the uh, EHOC, which is the Metropolitan Equal Housing Opportunity Council, who may take your claim of discrimination on housing matters, uh, primarily in the county, but they also they work sort of region wide, including over in Illinois, for those of you who may be on from Illinois. Uh, uh, they could take your claim of discrimination. Um, and again, we do the city to the river, we do the river to Skinker uh, in, in housing as well. So. Uh, there are other entities that will take some of them, but I would argue there are also not many. Thank you for that. I'm looking up the answer to this question, which I'm not sure if on top, off top, if um, O'Fallon is the question, what action can, can we take in O'Fallon? The question, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the guidance that you mentioned was look at the website of the city, mm -hmm. the municipality, to look at literally what their non-discrimination clauses say. 
Um, I'm going to try to do that while we're talking here, but um, essentially what you will probably find is that it has the basics of like race, gender, I mean, race, national origin, religion, sex, and Color. marital status and Color. Yeah, maybe, oh my goodness, I forgot that Missouri is still 1940. Um, so what I would suggest, Alex, who just asked that question is double check your website. I'm looking, I'm trying to look while we're here just so I can support, but um, O'Fallon, yeah, it looks like the, the link that I found, again, not legal advice, but um, all persons within the city of O'Fallon are free and equal and shall be entitled to the full use of employment um, and of enjoyment within this city um, in any place of public accommodation without discrimination or segregation on the grounds of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, ancestry, or disability. So sex mm -hmm. is the very kind of thing that's basically being argued next week, which is to say that doesn't say sexual orientation, it doesn't say gender identity, and that's one of the things that we really, those of us who do policy work, you know, Samadhi and I both testify at the State House often, which we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, sex, like sexual orientation and gender identity, we would love for that to be explicitly covered in every case possible. But in the meantime, given that so many states, I think it's 26 maybe, that still don't have those explicit protections, um, the, pretty much every state has a sex clause. Essentially, the federal government has a sex clause, mm -hmm. which is what is being argued next week um, in the sense that if you like have a sex or are experiencing something related to your a sex stereotype that you live in, which is essentially if you're trans, that basically you're 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 being sex stereotyped. If somebody says you are you are free to be like fired because you are trans, really, what they're saying is you're free to be fired because your sex is not you're not living the stereotypical life according to the, the gender that you were assigned at birth or the sex quote unquote that you were assigned at birth. So what we really want to highlight is that as much as is possible, we're trying to create that sexual orientation and gender identity explicitness. But in the meantime, um, some good news is that the Supreme Court of Missouri um, has interpreted sex to be inclusive of gender, of gender identity discrimination. So basically, for those who don't know, back earlier this year, actually, the Supreme Court of Missouri ruled that in, in, in a case with a young a student who was trans, um, was trying to use the boys' bathroom. He had all of his legal documentation uh, uh, correct for his correct gender, and they, the school district was trying to keep him from using that bathroom. The Supreme, it went all the way up to the Missouri Supreme Court, and they ruled that he should have been able to use the bathroom and that he was experiencing sex discrimination. So while we don't have state law protection, um, we don't have, it has not been, like Mona, which we'll talk about, has not been amended to be inclusive of sexual orientation, gender, gender identity discrimination, or, or protections. Um, in the meantime, we do live in one of the few states, I think there's like four or something, that have um, interpreted sex explicitly in that state to potentially cover those cases of discrimination. So hopefully that answers some of the questions about county and, sta and state, but we will talk right now a little bit about not only why you should have a state um, law, but also like really to help you all understand, essentially we've gone through what your rights are. Like yeah. <laughs> at this point, we've listed them. <laughs> so yeah, like, so just to, just to articulate that because it can be, your questions may, may or may not have been answered. You may or may not, now you may just be realizing you don't live in a city with protections or, or a municipality with protections or a county area, unincorporated area. Like you <laughs> might be frustrated and confused, right? So part of this webinar is both to give you those steps to walk through it and to let you know what your options are. And the other part is given that, I know I live with this frustration every day, that we don't have as many protections and explicitly can't say you should just call this person this office got your back you know what i'm saying we would love to live in a state like that but we are not the only ones that don't live in a state like that and so to, to kind of bring it home here in missouri we um we want to like highlight oops my my computer doesn't cooperate we want to highlight again like the difference between and i kind of just said this the supreme court like establishing precedent um, and the case that, that happens next week and kind of how that relates to the Missouri Supreme Court um, versus like what we actually can work to change here in Missouri. So essentially, um, just to clarify for those who may have not been clear or just want just to kind of say it out loud, the Supreme Court helps establish precedent, right, by interpreting the law. So, you know, a law is passed and then it makes its way up through different courts and which of course we know the courts are just one way to um, think about our rights, think about what has happened in the past and what they wanna you know, interpret to, to say should happen. They say it's just about the past and like, so again, we interpreting the law, 
that has already been set, but they're also telling the future about what is allowed, right? So at the end of the day, they're just interpreting laws that already exist, laws or rights or, um, you know, court decisions that have already been established. But at the end of the day, because we know the courts are just one level and one type of lane of government, it's still up to us to fight to make sure that the correct laws are passed, right? To make sure that the correct, um, in this moment, we have explicit protections for sexual orientation and gender identity, right? Or that we have explicit protections that sex does cover both of those things. Like, and that's what we're hoping for next week, right? And as I mentioned, Missouri has Supreme Court precedent, but no law, right, on the books. And that law, <laughs> so you want to tell us about it? I think it's one of your sure, favorite Sure, yeah, words. so one of Promo's biggest things, our big thing, like the, like, thing we want to do is pass the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, we call it MONA. Uh, it would add to the Missouri Human Rights Statute, kind of like what Jay Marie said earlier, like we can't, in Missouri, we're protected from discrimination based on sex, religion, race, color, ethnicity, nationality, religion, family status, disability, age, probably a handful of other things that I'm missing. But sexual orientation and gender identity are not on there. So the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act would add sexual orientation and gender identity to the Missouri Human Rights Statute, which says we can't be discriminated against in employment, housing, or public accommodations, which public accommodations um, under the Missouri Human Rights Act is actually broader than the Federal Civil Rights Act. Um, it includes like doctor's offices, gas stations, storefronts, that kind of thing. So because it's great if I have a job somewhere, it's awesome, but if I can't get a place to live there, if I can't get like groceries at the store, or like gas to fill my car because of my sexual orientation gender identity, that's that's not gonna that's not gonna cut it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like people say you can get married on Friday and lose your job. Exactly. Monday. So like great, we have marriage equality, awesome. I can marry any partner of any gender that I want, whenever, you know, consent obviously. Um, but then not a promo, but at a different place, lose my job or lose my housing or mm -hmm. We, if I go if I go to like a restaurant with my partner, we repeatedly denied services at those places. Um, Mona would make all of that um, illegal is the wrong word, but it would make it. It would prevent. It would. It would end that discrimination. It would, it would be. You would be explicitly protected. So that essentially, for those who yeah, like who want to get clear on this, unfortunately, right, we're not necessarily saying that doing this will prevent you from ever being discriminated right. against. That's right. Not. What we're actually saying, and what we're what laws help to do is create a certain level of clarity and it says that the state will support you if you are coming to them with the claim that you have been discriminated against. Right. So which means it puts people on notice, right? Yeah. It doesn't, just like the Civil Rights Act, didn't, these schools didn't <laughs> desegregate because we passed Brown versus Board. <laughs> when we, in reality, they and racism, did, racism didn't all of a sudden end when right. 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 <laughs> But what it did was work to create a precedent and to say, we're gonna put those of you who do not abide by this on notice to say it's gonna cost you money, it's gonna cost you your, you know, reputation, it's gonna cost you your standing in community because we have now decided as a country or as a city or as a state that this is the boundary that we have mm -hmm. when it comes to protections or this is the, this is the type of um, engagement we wanna have when it comes to someone coming to us and saying they've been discriminated against. What we hope and what we want is to, like for this, we would love for the laws and the, and the legislators to live this life where they go hard in the paint for us, those of us who are queer and trans and those of us who um, might experience some of this discrimination at work. What many of you might know from living in Missouri <laughs> is that we don't quite live in that state yet, right? Like the legislators that we know and that we have to talk to all the time are not necessarily rocking with that information. So in the meantime, um, some of our work, right, is, is to essentially fight to get those rights either back or in the first place for those of us who have never had them. Um, and so this, this slide kind of here is to say, you know, how do we get more rights? How do we get those that we don't, do not have yet or that, you know, how do we create that that standing or that commitment out loud, right? You have to essentially organize. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I wanted to say, and I should have put it on this slide, which is um, looking here at the bottom, if you sign up for this webinar, um, kind of going into this, how do we get more rights? You will be kept in the loop about opportunities to lobby for the rights we don't yet have. So promo has lobby days, ACLU has lobby days. Um, it's one of those things that you can do no matter who you are. It really helps if you are a person who has experienced something explicitly because that is what legislators respond to, right? Is like ex experiences, just like in almost in a discrimination claim, you would need to be able to say, this is what happened to me and be unapologetic about it, right? To say, this is what happened. This is what should have, this is what it should have been like. This is where I, where my employer got me, you know what I'm saying? Got me messed up. Like you need to be able to articulate that because we need to be the ones that articulate fully our experiences because no one else was there. Nobody else has the same boundaries and clarity around 
what we want to see that, than we do. Um, and so I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, but um, the question, I see a question here, which is um, gender identity and gender expression include gender expression as well. So yes. Ooh, yes, I wrote the definition. Yeah, down. perfect. Go ahead, yeah, tell yes. us somebody, tell so us. In the, so this is not the definition we're all gonna love because as LGBTQ folks, we all love to be wordy in our definition. But <laughs> the definition that we have in Mona for gender identity is the quote, appearance, mannerisms, or other gender related characteristics of an individual with or without regard to individuals assigned sex at birth. So that would cover gender expression as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, that's in the city's ordinance 68715. Uh, almost that language verbatim is awesome. in there. So yes. Yeah. So great question. Um, like, Player? I don't know how to say that person's name. I don't want to mess it up. But great question. Um, so it, the goal is yes, and everybody fighting for this legislation, we are fighting at the edges of what we know as community, right? To, to get that written down, to get that clear clear in, in the law as much as possible. It is already in the St. Louis city, and I believe Kansas City has a similar, almost exactly the same phrasing. And some of these ordinances um, for the municipalities also come with a, a very similar robust kind of set of protections. And the goal for us is to fight to make sure that that happens to everybody and has, it covers everybody in the state, right? It's not just mm -hmm. gonna be, I think I have a question that somebody sent me up on my phone. Okay. <laughs> um, that we want that to be covered in every case. Right. Um, and so a big part of having you on this call too, y'all, is just to make sure that you don't leave feeling less equipped or feeling discouraged um, because of the state and the climate that we live in. We hope that you actually feel more encouraged and, and feel clear about the abil your ability to get engaged and get involved. Um, so a couple of the things that you should know that are possible are that you, like, I, like we mentioned, you could be um, meeting with your legislator. It is still um, not legislative session right now. Um, so you could, you know, really you can do this all year long, but there might be a little more like available right now because they're not living in Jeff City. Excuse me, so between now and, and, the, and the end of December, you could email your legislator and, and let them know that you are a person who has experienced discrimination and that you deeply expect them to represent you just like they represent everybody else in your district, right? Um, when we say meet with the legislature, you could also meet with them when we do one of our lobby days. Um, so ours, I believe, is going to be February 18th. Finalizing that, we know it's winter time. <laughs> we're planning around it as much as possible. What can you do? Um, but we want to, I personally want to let you all know that, like, as somebody who isn't from Missouri, hasn't lived here my whole life, but has has quickly engaged with the state house and, and the legislators, it is, it can be frustrating. It can be dis discouraging in certain ways but I just don't want you all to discount your experiences. And I hope that your, whatever brought you on this call today will bring you to a place like Jeff City, will bring you to a place like some of these rallies we have coming up because it's more than just knowing your rights, it's about pushing back and holding on to them, right? So that they don't get taken or diminished in any way further. And so a lot of us since we're in the St. Louis City and County folks, presumably the audience is what we have now. Um, even if your representative is already supportive and like they're super, supportive of LGBTQ folks, it's invaluable to them to hear our voices as well, even if they already know, even if they already mm -hmm. are on our, on our team. Mm -hmm. Like, they, I mean, yeah. Yeah, they need to know, like, it's important to us and that we're not, yes. and that we are watching. That we don't take it for granted, yeah. that we are, like I said, that even if you have those rights or if you've come from a place where you've had them before, they need to hear what it's like to live, to feel like your dignity is being stripped when you landed in Missouri, right? Like, I travel away a lot. And I literally feel, I'm like, oh, going back to that state where I got no protections. <laughs> got it. Okay, great. All right. Okay, let me just figure out how to hold myself a little tighter, um, given that the state won't really look out for me the way that I would love for it to, but I'm fighting, and I hope that you all join us in doing that. Um, we have a question here. Oh, it's, a good, it's a good one. Um, you want to read it for us? Sure. Can... Someone asked a question of, uh, what would you coach employees to do with regard to collecting data for sex assigned at birth, gender identity, and sexual orientation? Do you support or encourage support and encourage or discourage? That's an interesting question. Um, it, said, it said employer? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. The, so the interesting thing about uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is if, if the reason people are collecting data, like a business, is actually for uh, their affirmative action program, then EEOC sort of looks the other way and says, then that's fine. Um, there are certain limitations to that, but it is if, if for example, um, you can tell I'm African American. So if, if stop it. So if <laughs> they were looking, if if an employer were looking to hire more African Americans in management position, they may actually ask people to fill out 
a small questionnaire may not have your name on it, but it may say, are you what and what position do you hold? Mm -hmm. That might be important to some employers as they walk down that road for um, more affirmative action and more inclusion. But the other side of the coin is make sure that's what they're doing and they're not just collecting data to, uh, and, and see who they can get rid of. Mm -hmm. So there are limitations, but there are, there are provisions in EEOC guidelines around that. Hopefully that, that clarifies. I would say essentially, you know, it's as far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to cap to to find out information. You, I mean, the questions that I've seen and and filled out right are always you know preferred not to disclose as an option. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to bring that in your data. It'll come up. Yeah. But essentially, when you offer that you know survey or inquiry into your employees' statuses and identities, um, there really is. I mean, I'm sure people are nefarious and find ways to turn this around, but there really is almost only a benefit to doing that um, in the sense that, you know, the more information you have, the more data you can kind of make better decisions based on and the more you can clearly understand what your standing is instead of turning a blind eye and saying, oh, well, if I don't collect it, that just means it'll come out in the shake, right? right. We don't, that's not, we live in a society where that's not the case. <laughs> Otherwise we wouldn't, a lot of these things wouldn't be the case, right? right. Yeah. Um, um, in addition, so promo, in addition to, lobbying efforts we do with policy stuff. We also do workplace trainings and um, workshops and stuff like that for employers that want more competency for their employee, in, for their workers and staff. Um, and we talk about, we, we talk about like the data gathering question, like, so why are we asking sex assigned at birth? What's the purpose? If it's for like equal opportunity and affirmative action kind of stuff, awesome. If it's just cause we're like curious, not so okay. So we, um, so we, we emphasize that in our trainings, like, what's the like what's the reason is it just yeah, to like totally. is it just to have the numbers okay that's probably fine is mm -hmm. it to like have the numbers and then do like weird stuff with that mm, not so much mm -hmm. yeah great yeah. there's a question here about text messages how can you how can they collect or document i believe what they're trying to ask text Ooh. messages is that can, can our picture like screenshots or pictures enough voice recordings like do you need to show that the number is the person's phone number like just because technically i guess you could say any name is any name so how yeah. would you advise people take i mean i think at minimum screenshots right like take yeah. screenshots, screenshots. Take what you have. yeah i would i would try to um uh copy and or save if you're getting text messages or you're getting screen or you're getting any, any email anything i would try to make sure you know maybe maybe find a way to print it off uh, most uh most smartphones now have the ability to print something out off of your uh wi-fi uh, I would find a way to, at the very least, save them, put them in a place in your phone or uh, at work that's locked so that you can keep them because any ammunition you can keep and save to be used is a good thing. And so, yeah, if somebody's texting you something really inappropriate, don't delete it. Um, and again, find a way to tell somebody else, hey, at 2 o'clock this morning, uh, somebody sent me this text message from work and we're saying all kinds of lewd and lascivious things and, and picture uh, yeah. along with it and, and those yeah. sorts of things. Save everything you possibly can. Don't delete it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that I know my phone, I, I can save voicemails. I can send voicemails to my email if I need to. I can, you know, I think you all know, we know where receipts are, right? <laughs> receipts are capture what happened, tell somebody else about it, put it in a folder, lock it down right? Mm -hmm. um, make sure that you have the information you have. Also, I would just one minor detail, I think, is like, if you are taking a screenshot, but you saved this person as like, you know, Jerry F, but like, you want to take a little bit more clear uh, planning and say, you know, manager at work, like whatever you can kind of ideally right. articulate so that you don't have to go back and be like, Jerry was the person at this point who was right here, just try to like take really good notes. Um, or, you know, what I, one thing you could even do is like create a Google Doc that has the screenshots just in a row mm -hmm. and you can make notes in it if you need to. Like that's just a suggestion for how to keep things if you're like on your phone, I want to do it real quick. Um, there's apps for these sorts of things and I think that could be helpful. But essentially collect as much as you can and, and all you can do is hope that your, rep, your representation um, or your rep at your workplace will like know what to do with that particular type of evidence. Yeah. Um, so just a few more comments though, y'all, about how we can fight a little more. Um, the, the lobby days are a part of it. Um, also writing an op-ed, don't take it for granted. I know we live on the, on the internet right now, um, but 
as that is clearly being you know questioned and compromised left and right there's really nothing like your story being out loud you know maybe a medium article technically i guess that also counts um but really like wanting you to value your experience and making sure that it gets heard um is a really important way to do it so one other thing <clears throat> Um, again, it's pretty similar, but again, like recording or sharing your story on video or writing. And I wouldn't say that you should do this instead of going through your employment process, your, your employer's process or your, your process to, to file a claim. I wouldn't um, suggest that. I don't know if you have any. No, I, 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 the best timing. Of yes. You, you got to go through your employer first, unless the harassment or the retaliation is just so bad that you feel so threatened that uh, you need to go to a, to, a, to a neutral third party. But I would say, even if it's CREA, if it's EEOC, Missouri Commission on Human Rights, they're going to say, did your employer try to rectify this? Right. And so we, unfortunately, we have to send people back to the lion's den. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think a lot of what this call can be summarized in, which I might have had a summary slide here shortly, um, is, I'll go back through this in a minute. Um, but Write down everything you experience. Um, this isn't even done. I'm going to go back to those slides really quick, but I just wanted to say for a moment, write down everything you experience, document your instances, um, tell your colleagues and friends, get contact information, go through the complaint process with the agency that you're talking about. Um, you know, some of this is related to like police or different things that you can file a complaint, however you need to file a complaint. You can, you might have to do it honestly, you might have to do it in ways that are frustrating or uncomfortable, but um, really want you to have that um, clear. The other thing that I wanted you to, to walk away with is that part of fighting out loud it may not be that your personal story is the one that we're gonna hear, but we do want you to get clear on kind of, I think Niles might've just mentioned it um, in the chat, which is like fight, you know, with your local um, different movements. So one of them is your label movement. And, and that's not a partisan thing, but it is like a different kind of container of work. So um, one thing that Niles is pointing out is that unions can also can create more explicit protections maybe than like your city can. So that's one um, angle of why having a union can be important um, or is important is because they basically figure out what you all want. You all use that representation and decide this is our boundary. It might be more intense and more specific than what the city has, what the state has. And so unions, that's just one reason why unions can be great. Um, what I will say just before we wrap up, there's some things coming up that we wanted you to know about. Um, essentially, some other ways that you can kind of raise your voice are that uh, we're doing something called 10 Days of Trans Demands in November. And essentially, um, I'm going to put the 10 demands up in a minute, but essentially, these are, just, these are just a couple things that you can do to, um, to support, like what we mentioned earlier, when it comes to your city or your state kind of creating a commitment to make sure that it, it is aware of how people are actually impacted. Like you have to say what's happening, right? We have to be the vocal ones to say, we've been experiencing it and, it, and, and no more, right? And so one way that we're doing that is having 10 days of trans demands where we are working to basically do an awareness campaign to expand what people know about trans difficulties, discrimination. A lot of times people are like, well, you're not talking about it, so how are we supposed to know anything's going on, <laughs> right? And it's like, as if they haven't silenced us, as if they haven't disbelieved us at every level. Unfollowed us on social media. Right, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Like, don't <laughs> believe you unfollowed, you got into some argument in the comments. <laughs> and then it's, you know, they're not even listening in the first place. So one thing that we're um, encouraging you to do is, is get involved with that. Um, one other thing you could do is work with a local organization to put on an AMA, which uh, another way to say that is ask me anything, which is essentially, we've done something like it. We called it Beyond Visibility, um, the ACLU. And it was basically a chance to have a set of panelists talk about what it's like to be trans beyond like what you might be able to talk to an individual about because you know i'm pretty sure we've all schooled people to say don't mm -hmm. ask us ridiculous sure. questions right but that means sometimes i, I know personally i am not a googleable experience that's just me doesn't mean that, that you can't learn things from google that might help you engage with me but uh, part of being on visibility events and part of asking me anything is that you get to be in your full humanity and actually share the nuance of what your life is like so that it doesn't become he said she said they said it's it's a, it's a chance for people to actually learn. And I think some of that is on our community and us to figure out how to hold people with grace and hold people um, in their learning process. Not that we are their learning process, but that we want them to learn. So how are we putting them in positions where they can learn from us and not from other people, not from those Google results that actually are not the results we want them to see, right? So um, that's another thing. And one of the things, you know, uh, we in the black community talk about, why do I have to teach white people mm -hmm. my experience? 
Well, part of that really is an education process. Yeah, I get stupid questions. <laughs> However, um, if you, you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what other people don't know right. about you right. uh, in, your, in your living experience. So sometimes these types of activities can be very helpful uh, because there are a lot of people who don't, they don't know someone who's trans mm -hmm. or they don't know that they know <laughs> someone mm -hmm. who's trans. Mm -hmm. And so, right. yeah, this is a whole different set of come with an open mind and, and, and certainly an open heart and, and just listen to that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one other thing that I will say, and I know we might have some employer folks on um, board here, which is that if you are an employer like, and you pay people, you are somebody who employs people, um, one of the best things you can do to be an ally or to be um, proactive is to both not only hire trans and GNC folks, trans folks, queer folks, LGBTQ folks broadly, but to also be diligent and create a complaints process, mm -hmm. which acknowledges that you know you don't know everything. And you want to make sure that not only does this person feel safe working here, but they can like they have official channels to let me know if I'm messing up or if my the workplace isn't being supportive as 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 we could and should be as, as and as my allyship would want it to be, right? So it's not something just to say, oh, I, I hired you know trans folks like I have all trans staff, beautiful, but do they feel safe working there? Do they feel clear about what their rights are? Do they feel like are they learning? Are they growing as employees? And do they feel like they can also grow, if, even if something doesn't sit right with them. Do they feel like they can share, share that with you? Um, that is essentially on, in, a long, in a long kind of, or a, a, a micro view of like what Promo is teaching people is like how to have a workplace and a complaints process where people do feel safe being employed, right? And so if you are an employer, you even have two or three staff, like just be diligent about that, be proactive about it, because that does show that you care and you're okay with messing up, not because you think they're gonna sue you, but because you wanna have a, an accountability process just because that's part of being employed. an employer is that you have processes where people can let you know if something's going wrong. And you know that the world's not gonna end, but you are you're working to be accountable to these folks um, that you employ. So just a little bit more about the 10 days of trans demand. So some of you might have heard about them or might've heard that we did a similar campaign last year, mm -hmm. but the, the power of this year's campaign is essentially um, that it's gonna be a little bit more robust than last year in the sense that, like I said, Trans stuff is more than just pronouns and bathrooms, right? Where it, it's things like decriminalizing sex work and HIV. Like HIV is already, a, a decriminalizing HIV is already a bill that Samadhi and I talk about annually. Um, when it comes to lobby day and when it comes to really telling folks that they should update their HIV laws, like that is something that, that disproportionately impacts trans folks who have to do sex work or are pushed out of other employment opportunities. Um, so that's one, right? Two, expanding Medicaid to include trans healthcare um, providing statewide and city healthcare protections. Those are things that may or may not be included in public accommodations, but we want them to be explicitly included because that's not the sort of thing that people should be worried about, right? You should be able to trust that you can get healthcare no matter your gender, no matter your sexual orientation, and anything in between, your expression, any of that. Um, going through them, statewide and city employment protections. We want not only for people to pass MONA, which would cover employment, but also in every city and municipality. Like we were, a lot of people were fighting for that because that was one of the only ways we really had the power to fight. But at this point, we have statewide, the ability to do statewide work. So we really see and hope that you join us in this work. And, you know, um, essentially the next one is similar. It's public accommodation protections. People should know that these are all separate demands. It's not just, okay, pass this one thing and all trans stuff right. is covered. Actually, there are many, many ways that folks are discriminated against, right? So um, halfway through, establishing transforming housing programs, right? So shelters, and, and given that we know that this administration is really pushing back on the ability to house people regardless of their gender, gender identity. We wanna make sure that cities and the state of Missouri is beyond that, right? We wanna be able to demand this and get people clear that this is what we deserve, right? And the other half is banning conversion therapy. There's a lot of movement, a lot of work on that. Columbia is working on banning it. Uh, I think they already have maybe. Um, and so like that's something that is, you know, folks in Kansas City are working on, folks in Columbia, um, Springfield, there's gonna be a lot of that down there, right? So we're really, really calling on you all to notice what's happening in your region and to, to pick one of these, um, you know, seven is obviously pretty specific to St. Louis closing the workhouse. Um, you know, we, we, there are trans folks who have been in the workhouse. There might be somebody in there right now who's trans, right? And who is being, dis, you know, discriminated against, disproportionately kind of uh, like treated essentially poorly because of the gender that they experience, because of the way that the people in the, in the workhouse will be kind of pushing them to a corner and saying, you, you can only experience gender this way. Of course, we know prisons are dehumanizing, so it's all on top of that, right? Um, the last three are letting trans kids learn, implementing trans affirming policy statewide. We know that 
a lot of harm is done to young people who don't fit into the binary, who experience gender in an expansive way. And so that's one of the demands that we're pushing. And we hope that you come up with an event that would like highlight that or help the community understand what that is. And I say community meaning statewide. We ask that, like I said at the top, we would love for you to, to supplement um, the overall work with what you are doing. Like our work in this, in this kind of 10 day window is really to highlight that trans folks are currently surviving and thriving in Missouri. It doesn't have this, it may not show that we have the laws in that form, but I personally know in all of my travels and all the miles I put in, trans folks are thriving in Missouri and finding ways, just as we have been for a really long time, to, to live full lives. So we would love to make sure that young people are included in that and we have you know an event or a film screening or a youth poetry, whatever you all think of or you see happening within the next week if you wanna supplement the overall movement with that information, the young people will be, you know, that's the demand we have. Um, establishing transforming faith educational and workspaces, really just tr spaces that are, speak to being trans ahead of time without it being about tragedy, right? Without it being about something negative that happened. We know that we've had our fair share of folks being murdered, um, gender expansive folks, trans folks being murdered, gay folks, queer folks, um, especially in the Kansas City area, really got to shout out those folks. They've been responding to things for months and months and months over and over and over. People like to think that, you know, really it's just the headline that matters and then we just go on about our scrolling, but really people like lives are being ended and communities are being upended when these folks are being taken. So really affirming trans affirming spaces or, or establishing those will go a long way to making sure the Missouri sees that we're here. We're not waiting for them to pass a law. We're actually already here, right? And lastly, something that really matters here is holding trans, transphobic and, and trans antagonistic reporting accountable. So like if, as much as we can get an event for every one of these things, we wanna make sure that people understand that being trans and being trans affirming and trans like expansive is is bigger than just one or two things bigger than just the headline of people being murdered it's actually a really really robust identity and you are still a person um which i think is a beautiful way to almost wrap up kind of the rights piece too is like essentially even if you are um experiencing something discriminatory the courts and you know the the case that's happening next week is just one opportunity one lane for you to do that so for instance you know if your if your speech is violated it doesn't have to be a trans or sex discrimination piece, right? You still have the Bill of Rights still applies to you. Um, and so there are ways that, you know, you can still get around some of these things. So be, be diligent, think, think critically about what it is that you um, like are hoping for. And I'm actually gonna um, just add a little bit. I'm gonna give you all a chance to kind of close out while I add your contact info, because yeah. I forgot to add that to the slides. Um, and so does anybody like have questions? Now is a great time. We have just about, <laughs> five six more minutes um for you all to take a minute to think about your questions and and then i'm going to include um folks information in the uh which i'm also going to send an email about it but just for folks who may not get that or don't do email well or something um take a minute to think about your questions write them in the comments or in the chat box um of course my computer wants to act up right now but yeah, so maybe some closing comments and then I'll put your, your information up for people to see. Well, we well, first out. of all, thank you uh, for Bobby Korea to be part of this process this evening. And I, I hope this is one of a number. But I think the overarching thing for me is, is two things. One, education and knowing that whatever happens after um, October 8th, uh, it just represents a new beginning. And how do we all work together to make sure that at the end of the day, we're not only talking about human rights, but civil, our civil rights, but human rights as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got a lot more allies to get on board, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, now's a good time to, to start and continue that process. Um, and, and then hopefully uh, people don't have to all move to the city of St. Louis to get protection. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, we want people to live in comfort and safety and know that they are uh, afforded all the protections uh, under federal, state, and local uh, government. Absolutely want that. Funny. Any closing comments? The, um, yeah, whatever happens on October 8th, is that going to stop what Promo is going to be doing or what the ACLU is going to be doing or stop what Korea, Korea from existing? Mm -hmm. like, even if the case is decided in the best way humanly possible, how do it start to go okay? Promo still believes that we need protections across the state and comprehensive, not just in employment, but in housing and in public spaces. Um, when I make the trip from St. Louis City to Jeff City, 
I shouldn't, my rights shouldn't change because I've settled in that St. Louis city or like driven through certain parts of the county. I should, <laughs> if I guy. stop for gas somewhere, I should, not be, I should not be denied service because, because of my sexual orientation and gender identity. That, mm -hmm. that, that should not be happening. Mm -hmm. um, so no matter, no matter what, promo is going to keep doing its, doing its work. Yeah. So I have on the screen for you all, just folks, um, emails. I believe I got it right. <laughs> Charles. Yes. Um, so, so y'all, please don't hesitate to, to communicate with us. Um, really want to make sure that you all are clear about not only the rights you have, but again, that your stories and your experiences are crucial to making sure that not only do we keep those rights, mm -hmm. but that we expand on the ones we deserve. Right. Um, so mostly I think that is fairly it for us. I don't see any other comments. Um, I did want to also mention that for those who wanted to share with other people that we um, are, you know, that we had this tonight or, or um, personally, if you wanted to be able to attend um, something that uh, would give you even more support. Um, essentially, I wanted to share with you that we do have the equivalent one, the equivalent to this essentially with some food and some in-person energy will be on Monday um, at MTUG. And I'm trying to pull that flyer up because it's always easier to see when it's represented with a flyer. <laughs> Um, sorry, I didn't include this in the, uh, in the documents, but, um, so there's, uh, Monday will, will be in person at promo. I mean, at MTUG, sorry, uh, 3133 Oregon. Um, really excited to be there with, with those folks. And th these folks won't be with me, but I will be doing a similar presentation based on what we talked about tonight. Um, as well as, um, this recording will be posted on uh, the ACLU YouTube channel. Um, so that is another option for those who want to look back or kind of watch uh, again to see how the process works or catch any questions we, you, we might have um, left out. Um, and otherwise, I think, let me just double check if there's any questions. Because um, I, think, I think we pretty much, pretty much nailed that. And of course, my computer wants to act up right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, essentially, I'll let folks uh, Take a second. Oh, it looks like we might have one comment. Might just be a thank you. There we, there we go. Yeah, no problem. So thank you all for being here. Um, I don't, the flyer is acting up, so I won't uh, try and pull it up any, any further. But essentially, um, you are being kind of put into the network of those of us who will be lobbying, those of us who are fighting to do this work. Um, because if you have a, a curiosity about knowing your rights, chances are you want to probably also keep those rights. So we'll, we'll keep you in the know about those things. Um, keep Labor Day or lo Labor Day, Lobby Day on your radar. Um, keep Monday, um, I will say, I meant to say Monday, we're having an in-person, but also Sunday, the 13th, there will be a rally mm -hmm. for workers' rights, trans and queer workers' rights at City Hall from 11 to 1. Um, really, we'll talk about the 10 days of trans men. We'll talk about some of the folks that mentioned, you know, union support. There's so many different things that we can be doing, but are only as effective as we point, like band together, do them together. Organizing, um, as one of my mentors says, um, yeah, we'll paste it on the Facebook page. I believe it's on the page, but I'll, I'll go back in and put it, um, definitely. Uh, for those who, um, who have heard this, but have, maybe haven't heard it like this, essentially, you know, power concedes nothing without an organized demand. It's one thing to say any demand, but if it's organized and those of us who believe in it are all together and on one accord, we can really do anything that we want, right? Power to the people, power of the people. So um, the flyer will be posted on the um, webinar page as well as on the spaghetti um, dinner, which is Monday's page. Uh, look for it on the ACLU website, ACLU social. Um, essentially, we don't want you to miss out on it, y'all. And it will also be um, going out to, uh, I think, not one of our one of the organizers for the rally on Sundays in the chat and posted it. Um, I can see if I can actually upload the flyer here before we close out. Um, but yeah, because it has a few different things, both the flyer for the rally as well as the the Monday activities. Um, so yeah, y'all, as I pull that up, feel free to, to be on your way. But we have a couple of last minutes for, for questions if you want that. Otherwise, um, thank you for joining us, y'all. And I'm gonna, so I put the, um, the file in the, full, in the file here with the, the all three events, which includes today's webinar, of course, Monday night's event, and then um, the Sunday, Sunday rally. Sunday. So um, even if you're not able to come, you know, send your regards, post about it, share about it spread the word because really uh, what it is really about is creating a, a shared and not only an organized demand, but a shared experience of like trans folks are going to be free in Missouri. Like that's what we're going to do together. We're not going to let it happen on our watch that people continue to have to leave the state because they don't find 
the freedom that they deserve. Yeah. So thank you, Samani. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Y'all have a great Thursday. I know I'm going to see an artist, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> thank you all for being here so much. Hope you have a, a powerful night. Um, and we will see you in the streets, you know what I'm saying? See you online, see you at Lobby Day, all that good stuff.